What does it mean to choose life? Our key verse tonight is Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Deuteronomy 30. We're going to spend the night in that chapter. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. We stand at a point in this nation that there is a there's a pending decision by the Supreme Court in the abortion case out of Mississippi a draft opinion which was leaked to the press that could put this question squarely before our nation again but as our text will make abundantly clear tonight while this choice encompasses abortion It goes much further to the root cause of abortion, and that is the rejection of God and his word. I believe our nation stands at a point of making a decision as to whether or not, once again, we will choose to follow God and to obey his word. I was reading a news report last Thursday about the shooting that took place in Tulsa at a medical center. You probably read about that. There's been this wave of shootings that have taken place over the last few weeks. The reporter interviewed a woman named Kelsey Orsi who worked at one of the medical buildings there at St. Francis in the, on the campus there in Tulsa where the shooting took place. And she came out to the parking lot. She was getting in her car to go. And of course, everything was blocked. And a reporter got her and, and started asking her questions. So she was interviewed for this article. And she said this. She said, quote, I lost my adult son to gun violence in April. So this hits close to home. I'm still processing, uh, she said, at that point, as she looked across the, the campus and the various buildings. She says, I've worked in all of these different buildings. And she, she was really shaken by this whole thing. And she went on to say this. She said, quote, I'm going to be praying over these families affected by this today and for the love of Jesus over this country. And she said, shaking her head, she said this, this is historic, what is happening in this country right now. It feels like the enemy is growing nearer. I'm sure the reporter did not perceive the prophetic statement that this woman made or they wouldn't have printed it. This is historic, what is happening in our country right now. And it is also spiritual. The forces of darkness are enraged and they are refusing to give up the territory that they've gained in this nation and in our culture. And I believe that the violence that is sweeping our nation is connected to the Supreme Court decision on abortion. But it is about a lot more than abortion. It is about the heart and soul of this nation. If you have your Bibles, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 30. By the way, many, every time I'm out, many people ask me, what, what news sources, where do you get your news from? Because you're looking for reliable news sources, not the legacy media but news sources. And so just last week, the Family Research Council launched a new online news service called Washington Stand. In fact, tonight, if you want to, uh, this will be the few times you do this, but you can take out your phone. If you want to text news to 67742, tonight I'm going to give away 10 of our stand mugs. We're going to have a drawing and, uh, and we'll contact you and uh, give you that mug, but you can go each day. It's constantly updated with news and commentary from a biblical perspective. And so we're filling that void with news and information that comes to you from a biblical perspective. You can trust it, and it's coming to you from a perspective that it doesn't attack faith, but it affirms it and embraces our Christian faith. So go ahead and you can text that news to 67. 742. All right, our text tonight, Deuteronomy chapter 30. This passage is specifically for Israel as God presents the conditions of the covenant with them as they go into the promised land. Now, while the covenant that we read here is for Israel, the principles contained in this passage are universal. As the preacher and scholar Matthew Henry wrote, he said, they belong to all persons and all people. They apply to us today. In fact, the applicability of this passage is evidenced by Paul himself quoting this in Romans 
chapter 10. So beginning in verse 1 of Deuteronomy chapter 30, now it shall come to pass when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord God drives you, and you return to the Lord your God and obey his voice according to all that I command you today, and you and your children with all of your heart and with all of your soul, that the Lord your God will bring you back from captivity and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. If any of you are driven out to the farthest parts under heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will bring you. Then the Lord your God will bring you to the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. He will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. Also, the Lord your God will put all these curses on your enemies and on those who hate you, who persecuted you. And you will again obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments, which I command you today. The Lord your God will make you abound in all the work of your hand and in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock and in the produce of, the, of your land for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over you for good as he rejoiced over your fathers, if if you obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes, which are written in the book of the law, and if you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. For this commandment which I command you today is not too mysterious for you, nor is it too far off. It is not in heaven that you should say who will ascend into heaven for us to bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it, nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart that you may do it. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. And that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments, his statutes and his judgments that you may live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. But, but if your heart turns away so that you do not hear and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life, that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, and that you may cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give to them. Father, again, we thank you for our time together, and we do pray that your word would not return unto you void, but you would use it to transform our lives. Lord, touch us, change us by your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. To choose life is to choose to love God, which means we will obey and follow him with all of our heart and all of our soul. That's what it means to choose life. But what happens? What happens when a nation or an individual has made the wrong choice? Well, this passage has the answer. Repent and return to God with a resolve to obey and follow him. And then God says, watch as I restore the blessings of life upon you. That is true for individuals, it's true for families, and it is true for a nation. Now, I know that this probably makes us sound like Christian nationalists in the eyes of the legacy media. But you know what? I would rather have the blessing of God than the approval of the media any day. Now, let's answer this question. Why? this manifestation of evil right now. 
I mean, I think we have to start looking at the world around us with spiritual eyes. And that's why I'm grateful for Pastor Jack and other pastors like him. But he is at the forefront in teaching you to have a biblical worldview, to see the world around us from the lenses and through the lenses of Scripture. If we're not seeing what is happening through spiritual eyes, we're either going to become afraid, we're going to become discouraged, and we'll become ineffective in what God has called us to be. But when we begin to see things through spiritual eyes, through the lenses of Scripture, and, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, through His Word, then things begin to make sense. And we say, figures. I understand that. Look, time is too short. I am not going to dance around the issue to try and placate the mockers and the critics. Let the mockers mock and the critics abound on social media. I don't care. The hour is too late to concern ourselves with them. Our nation is in a situation that it's in because too many Christians feared being ridiculed, mocked, or canceled. But guess what? They can't cancel me. I've already been crucified in Christ. Amen. That said, when we look at what is happening in this country right now with spiritual eyes, we can see all of this violence that it's related to this decision that is before the Supreme Court and this moment in the history of this nation. Now, while the Supreme Court is not solely responsible for the moral and the social chaos that has enveloped our country and our culture, they bear much of the responsibility. The court took the godless philosophies of men like Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Friedrich Nietzsche and others like the priest in the, the Old Testament on the high places, they have used this philosophy of men to supplant the law of God. And we've lost the truth of God in our laws and in our country. One of the first moves that the court made in this area came back in 1962. The U.S. Supreme Court case, Ingle versus Vitale. And by a vote of eight to one, the court outlawed prayer in our public schools. Now the following year, in the Abington School District versus Shemp, the court ruled that the reading of the Bible and the Lord's Prayer in public schools were illegal. So what's happened since our nation, to our nation since then? Are, are we in a better shape? Well, let me give you, let me just compare a few st statistics from 1963 and today that I think paints a very clear picture of the moral and the spiritual chaos that has enveloped our land. In 1963, the percentage of babies born to unwed mothers was 6.3%. In 2020, the percentage of babies born to unwed mothers was 40.5%. In 1963, there were only two major sexually transmitted diseases. Today, there are approximately 25 different sexually transmitted diseases, and that doesn't include monkeypox. <laughs> According to the Centers for Disease Control, there are 20 million new cases each year. And roughly three, one out of every three Americans has an STD. In fact, over the last seven years running, each year has set a new record with the number of sexually transmitted diseases in this land. Of course, what do you think when we, when, when we have a culture that's defining itself by its sex? In 1963, there were 186 deaths that year due to drug overdoses, which was 0.1 per 100,000. Last month, the CDC announced yet another record broken with the latest data on drug overdose deaths, 70,630, 21.6 per 100,000, or 193 a day. In other words, more are dying in America because of drug overdoses every day than they died the entire year in 1963. At the end of last year, the FBI reported the United States 
In 2020, experienced the most significant rise in murder since the start of national record keeping in 1960. Now, is there a causal relationship between rejecting God and the downward spiral of culture? Like I said, the media and the others will scoff and mock at such a notion, but the Word of God warns us of the consequences of rejecting the Lord and His Word. Look at what Paul writes in Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Is that not what is happening in today's world where we're suppressing the truth with unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. You see, what is happening in America today is that we are suffering the consequences of our choices. But here is the promise of God. It is not too late to turn around. You know, the president after these shootings, he's gotten on TV a couple of times and he says, when in God's name will we do something? <laughs> it is when we will call on the name of God. Yeah. And this passage is a call to repent and return to God. This speaks prophetically to the nation of Israel and to the in gathering that is and will take place of the Jewish people, but there are principles for, he for us here as well, similar to what we see in the story of the prodigal son in the New Testament. Look, God wants us to be restored in relationship with him. That's individuals and that's nations. Look at verse one and two of our text. Now it shall come to pass when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I set before you, and you call them to mind among the nations where the Lord your God drives you out, and you return to the Lord your God and obey his voice according to all that I command you today, you and your children, with all your heart and with all your soul. That's what he's calling us to. If we'll return, if we will repent. Now don't miss what I'm about to share with you. As we stand at one of the most significant moments I believe in the history of our nation. On May 2nd, a DC-based publication obtained and released a draft opinion of the Supreme Court written by Justice Samuel Alito. Here is what the court's majority says in that opinion. Quote, we hold that Roe and Casey must be overruled. The Constitution makes no reference, reverence, reference to abortion and no such right is implicitly protected by any constitutional provision. End quote. The court is completely overturning the two previous cases on abortion, essentially repenting of abortion. The word for repentance in the New Testament, metanoia, means to change your mind and with it your behavior. The court is changing its mind on abortion. But the underlying issue is of whose morality will govern our nation. That's what's at the heart of this decision, which requires that we have a resolve to wholly return to God. It's not just enough to repent. We have to return to God. We have to have a resolve. You know, I often gauge the significance of a matter based upon how those who stand in contradiction to the word of God react. The outsized reaction of some on the left shows the far-reaching significance of this decision. Immediately following the publication of this opinion that was leaked, Democrats Senate leader Chuck Schumer said this. <laughs> I can see he has no fans in here. The Republican appointed justices reported votes to overturn Roe v. Wade would go down as an abomination, one of the worst and most damaging decisions in modern history. No, abortion is abomination. <laughs> During an interview with the Seattle Times editorial board, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi said, an opinion that overrules Roe v. Wade, quote, has an impact beyond a woman's right to choose. 
She goes on to say the next thing could be gay marriage equality. There's so many other things that once you've dispensed with precedent and privacy that they could have the majority to do, she added. And then there was President Joe Biden. He said, quote, it's not only the brutality of taking away a woman's right to control her own body. No, Mr. President, the brutality is taking the life of unborn children in the womb of their mother. He said, mark my words, they are going to go after the decision on same-sex marriage, end quote. The reaction of the left reveals that they too know that this is about more than abortion. In fact, abortion is just a symptom of the underlying issue that the court decision recognizes. By overturning Roe and Casey, the prevailing jurisprudence on abortion, the Supreme Court is dismantling the high places, the idols of our day upon which our morality has been based. See, the real issue in this case, and this is why this is a pivotal moment for the, na for the nation, is that we are revisiting the issue of whose morality will we be governed by. Who will define right and wrong? Will it be God or will it be man? As I pointed out earlier in the early 60s, the Supreme Court removed God and suddenly, be suddenly began to replace the moral law of God, which the founders in the Constitution referenced as the laws of nature and nature's God. They've replaced that with the preferences of the individual. In other words, the court over the last 60 plus years has replaced God with man, substituted the transcendent truth of God with the preferences of the individual. You see, morality today is seen as nothing more than personal choices. Emboldened by their transformative effects of their decisions, the court clearly stated this supplanting of God's truth back in 1992. What I'm about to quote you was written by Justice Anthony Kennedy in one of the two cases that is poised to be overturned, Planned Parenthood versus Casey, and I quote, at the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. Beliefs about these matters could not define the attributes of personhood were they formed under the compulsion of the state. Now, Carl Truman, in his book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, writes about this statement, and he says this, quote, such a statement should really be deemed incoherent, especially when it comes from a legal body because it is arguably mystical in its approach to personhood. And he goes on to write, and what law does not exist if it does not establish or maintain some kind of compulsion or restraint of a broader notion of human personhood that transcends the personal convictions of any given individual. You see, this explains why those on the left responded to the leaked draft as if the world was coming to an end. Because in reality, their world of made up rights could be coming to an end. So what is needed? What, what are we to do at this moment? Well, this is at the heart of what I wanna to share tonight. The court may very well tee up repentance, but they will not have the resolve to walk it out. The repentance that America needs will not come from government. It can't. It must come from the church. Pastors must preach and teach the word, specifically challenging followers of Jesus Christ to do just what the Bible teaches us over in Deuteronomy 30, 20, where he says to love the Lord, obey his voice, and cling to him, for he is our life. That is the resolve that we need to walk out this moment of repentance. Pastors and Christian leaders need to challenge believers to counter the increasingly aggressive, godless culture. And you know what? This begins in the home. Parents and grandparents must begin to fulfill their God-given responsibility to teach the word of God to their children and their grandchildren. In Deuteronomy 6, it says, 
We're to do this. We're to be talking of it when they sit in the houses, when they walk by the way, when they lie down and when they rise up. When we, what we need in America is a revolution of, rev, of resolution to return and obey God. And it begins in the home. Elections are great. They're important. And we've got to elect God-fearing men and women. But that's not enough. Our pulpits must be aflame with the truth of God's word, and it must burn in our hearts as believers and followers of Jesus Christ. And as parents, we must model it out in our homes and teach our children, whether they're in private schools or Christian schools, it does not matter. Whether they're in public schools, it does not matter. You know, God has given us as parents the authority and the responsibility to teach our children. He hasn't given it to the state. And this idea that the state says, we know better about what is best for your children than you do, I'm going to tell you where that's from. It's, you're absolutely right. It comes from the devil from the pit of hell. And we need to stand up against that and say, no, not on my watch, not with my children. You see, as a parent, as a parent, you can delegate the authority. You can do that. You can delegate the authority to a, to a local school, to a private school, to a Christian school, to a public school. You can do that. But you can never delegate the responsibility. God is not going to hold that teacher accountable. God is going to hold you as a parent accountable. And, and we, can have these, we can have the elections, and, and I'm grateful for the Christians that are getting engaged in elections. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to see what's happening in California. A lot more needs to happen, but I'm, I'm encouraged with what's happening already. But unless we reach the hearts of the next generation, the clock is going to run out on us. Now, I'm praying the Lord would return soon, like tonight. But until he does, we need to be found faithful doing what he has called us to do. And we've got, to, this is why the battle is raging for children. They know that if they can indoctrinate the children with their godless ideology, confusing them about the very way that God made them, that they can continue to lead them astray and they can control the future of this country. It starts in the home with moms and dads who will not just tell them Bible stories, but will live out in their presence biblical truth. See, we're to return to God with our whole heart and soul. We're not... We're not to be casual about our relationship with God. We must be intentional about following him, about heeding his instruction, about living it out in our homes and challenging our children to live for God. It is a time for a revolution of resolution to follow God. Look, I think... This is the president. Go back to what President Biden said. He said, where in God's name is our backbone? He said, it's time to act. We have to do more. Well, I think we'll find the courage to stand when we call upon the name of God in humble repentance. We must restore a sense of right and wrong based not upon personal preference, but upon the transcendent truth of God. You know, I, I've been having this conversation with many of the Republican leaders almost every day. There's this debate going on about gun control. I mean, you have the Democrats, I mean, they're rolling out their talking points. We've got to have gun control. Well, look, we've got to go beyond that. And I've told the Republicans there who are talking about we've got to harden the targets. I said, look, those are... Those are fine conversations to have 
They're practical. We got to have them, but we've got to go beyond that to the source of the problem. It's not the object that's in the hand. It's the void that's in the heart. The latest study that was done on over two decades worth of these school shootings, 82% of the young men involved in these shootings came from broken or dysfunctional homes. We're not talking about that. We're not having conversations about how the government, despite spending $20 trillion on the war on poverty, has not touched child poverty. We have more children living in poverty today than we did in the 1960s. We've crowded out the family. We've told women they don't need a husband and children they don't need a father. And then we get these results. And we want to talk about gun control. What will be the next object that we try and control? We have to go back and look where we went wrong. We kicked God out of our schools. We removed prayer, the Ten Commandments. And then we wonder why evil has been promoted to the head of the class. Folks, you, you can watch this. I'm sure that the, the, the left on the social media will be going crazy about this. But here's the bottom line. We need God in America again. And I make no apologies for that because God says, you return to me with a resolve to walk with me and I will restore the blessing even more so than what I had given to your fathers. You want America to be blessed or you want to continue to pay $7 a gallon for gasoline? Or watch your grocery bill triple. You have to see these through spiritual eyes. These things are not just happening in a vacuum. Our children have been carried away captive by a godless culture. In fact, we're living in many ways in captivity. That's why I, I hate to travel. I hate to go to the airport because, you know, when you go to the airport, you feel like you are a captive. And it, it is, I, I tell you, I, I have to pray every time I go to the airport. You know, you got you to take, after the shoe bomber, you had to take your shoes off. And I was flying, uh, this has been, a couple, been several years ago, but I was flying the day after they had the underwear bomber, and boy, was I nervous. <laughs> but you know, historically, and, and I know this as, as a police officer, once you book someone, one of the first things you do, you take their, their clothes and their shoes. You know, we... we we have given up our freedom. And part of it, the main reason is because God has removed his hand of protection from this land because of our sin. How can we say that we're a nation that God can bless when we have condoned the taking of over 60 million unborn children? When we've kicked God out of our schools and out of our public spaces and we expect God to bless us, I, I, don't, I don't understand that. But we're at a point, folks, that if the church does not get on its knees, repent for our indifference, for our complacency, and for our sin. And then with a resolve, stand up and say, we will follow the Lord. That's America's only hope. And we cannot be dissuaded by the critics. We cannot be discouraged by the mockers. Let them mock, let them criticize. They don't have anything better to do. Who cares? I don't watch the media anymore anyway. I don't listen to it. I don't care about it. I don't read what people put on Facebook unless they're nice people. <laughs> Look, if we want God to restore the blessings of life to us and to this nation again, look at verse 8. 
And you will again obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments, which I command you today. The Lord your God will make you abound in all the work of your hands, in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, and the produce of your land for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over you for good as he has rejoiced over your fathers if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. You see, that opportunity of abundant life awaits you And it awaits us as a nation if we repent and return to God. If we resolve to love and obey him, then we can watch as he restores life and hope where death and despair has previously ruled. America stands at a pivotal moment. I believe that when we will look, when we're in eternity, We'll look back on this time, and this will be one of the most significant times, not just in the history of this nation, but I believe of mankind. And God has entrusted this moment to us. What will we do with it? Will we just continue to go on as life as normal? Folks, we cannot live life as normal anymore. We cannot be content just to kind of glide through life. God is calling us to have a resolve to return to him, to love him like we've never loved him before, to cling to him and to allow his blessing to flow upon our lives in this nation again. We will determine the future of this nation. Now, we need to be praying that the court moves forward with this decision to tee up this change of mind as it pertains to abortion. In fact, you probably saw this. There was a a man that was arrested from California, apparently, outside Justice Kavanaugh's home who wanted to kill him over this opinion. If that doesn't tell you the significance of this moment, I don't know what does. What will we choose? Life or death? We, we will make that choice for this nation. Father, I thank you for your word. And I believe that you are putting before us that same choice that you gave to the children of Israel as they came into the promised land. I believe you give that choice to every nation. And I thank you for our forefathers that, Lord, they chose to build a nation upon biblical truth, upon that transcendent truth, expecting that subsequent generations would live guided by that biblical faith. But Lord, we've seen in the last 60 years how that has come under attack and how quickly our children and subsequent generations have strayed. And now, Lord, we live in a land of confusion. But Lord, I thank you that we we have men and women of faith, of Christian faith on the Supreme Court. And they're going back to the very foundations, to the bedrock And they're tearing down the high places, the philosophies of men that have been exalted above the truth of God. Father, I pray you would prepare us for this moment, that, Lord, we would have a resolve to return to you, and that, Lord, that we would walk out repentance, and that, Lord, we would see this nation once again in a posture that you could bless this nation. I'm gonna ask you to stand with me as we end our time together and I want you to pray with me. I want you to pray for our nation. I cannot overemphasize the significance of this moment in time. You've got to see all that's been happening in our country, the violence, 
the division. It is evil versus good. It is life and death. What will you choose? Father, hear our cry tonight. Right where you are, I just want you to begin to pray. Just pray out loud, right where you are. We're just going to take a moment to pray. Intercede for this nation. Intercede for the court. Begin to pray for your family. Begin to pray that God would give you the courage to choose life and to walk it out as he has designed it. And maybe you're here tonight and you need that relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe you've never repented of your sins. I don't want you to leave here tonight without experiencing the blessing of God and being restored to a relationship with your creator. If that's you tonight, I want to pray for you as others are praying there and as they're standing there. If that's you tonight, I just want you to to step out and come down here to the altar. And we're going to have some pastors down here that will pray with you. But if that's you tonight, I know it's a Wednesday night, this is the the core of the church, but you might be here tonight, you've never invited Jesus Christ as your, to come into your heart to be your Lord and Savior, you've never confessed him with your mouth, you've never truly believed in your heart that he died for you and that there can be freedom and forgiveness in him, tonight's the night for you. And then you can be a part of helping this nation choose life. Once you've made that choice, if that's you tonight, I just want you to step out right now and come on down here to the altar as others are continuing to pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that we can come before you boldly before the throne of grace. And we cry out to you on behalf of this nation. God, please stir us in our hearts that we would no longer be complacent, that we wouldn't just do life as normal, but Lord, we would realize the significance of this moment. And I pray for courage for those Supreme Court justices, that Lord, they would not shrink back through the intimidation that hell has unleashed upon them. Lord, I I pray, Lord, that even the media, Lord, could not miss this moment. Lord, I, begin, I pray you begin to reveal yourself in such a way that the church will not miss this. Father, be exalted in this moment. And Lord, we'll be fools for you in the eyes of the world because we know America needs you. We know every nation needs you, but if America is going to continue to lead and we're going to be a nation that can be blessed, we need you back in America again. We invite you, Father, back into our homes. We invite you back into our communities. We invite you back into our schools. And Lord, we pray that you would move in this hour. God, may we not miss you. May we not miss this moment to return to you. Pour out your spirit upon us, God. Pour out your spirit upon us.